I must tell you, my friends, that the good news that you have heard me preach was no human invention. I didn't take it over from any man, but I heard it directly as a revelation from Jesus Christ. It's a typical blast from one of Paul's missionary letters, the oldest Christian documents in the world. And the letters seem authentic enough, too. In the last hundred years, archaeologists have dug up all sorts of circumstantial detail that Paul mentions in his letters. And the style, too, is exactly right. Exactly right for a Roman letter of that period, with one essential difference. Paul's vigorousness has actually twisted the rather elegant classical form into a sort of unique tirade, because the man's got a message. He's, in fact, got the first Christian message to the West. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Paul and the Apostles took their message to almost every town of the Roman Empire, and certainly to here, the suburb of Herculaneum in the shadow of Vesuvius. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I may have faith strong enough to move mountains, but if I have no love, I am nothing. There is nothing love cannot face, no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. Wow. This hardly looks like a tired and hungry world searching for a new faith. As the Christian explanation of how their religion managed to conquer the Roman Empire so often goes. And this is a house from St Paul's time. Urban Italy, house of a small merchant. It's got enough money to get in Greek mosaic artists, nice fresco painters. This is a little courtyard. You couldn't afford much room in a town, but you could fill it full of goodies. And that's what the guy's got. Now, his society, and that's the society really of all the Roman Empire, is of small people, small groups of people, each with their own gods and each with their own interests. A very, very busy place. Everybody's working very hard. It's the sort of society, in fact, that inevitably you're going to get people who are discontented in it. People who are running along and saying, why am I having to run so hard? Where am I going? There's a vacuum there. And in a sense, it's that vacuum which Paul is going to fill. He preached Christian love from the rooftops. And he got a big following. Not a majority, but enough in a couple of centuries so that the emperors themselves, realising this strange power of a religion that seemed to cement people into new alliance, would use it for the empire. It became the imperial religion, the Bible, the imperial book. So the story is then how this arch, this great shrine, which for so many centuries had housed the gods, gods like this, and the pagan emperors themselves, ended up housing the Bible and the cross. Sunday morning, in one of the oldest churches in Rome, the Bible is carried to the high altar. This beautiful ritual is much older than the Christian church. Almost everything here, the great arch above the altar, the incense, the chanting, all have their origins in the court of the pagan Roman emperors. In those days, though, it was the emperors, the great persecutors of the Christians, and not the Bible that sat at the building centre. Dicit ergo eis, Jesus, amen, amen, dico vobis. These same pagan emperors put the Bible to work, part of their remedy for a failing government. They came down from the throne, joined the congregation and worshipped Jesus Christ. And they took the Bible and set it at the heart of their empire. And this 
was the beginning of the Bible's most extraordinary journey from ancient East to modern West. The Bible's journey started around 300 AD when the pagan emperor Diocletian, that most terrible of all the Christian persecutors, had ruled for about 20 years and was living here at Split in a huge palace on the Yugoslav coast. In Diocletian's time, when you came to see that great old emperor, as you walked through these palace gates and into the courtyard of the imperial audience chamber, you'd have been feeling very, very frightened. Diocletian wasn't a man, he was actually a god. And this is as near as you would have got to him. This really cathedral-like building is actually the courtyard of his palace. And that arch there in the middle, well, that's the focus of it all. Under that, he would have sat in his throne. You would have seen him because there'd have been great silk curtains hanging down. Now, there'd have been lots of other people waiting for the audience here. And I expect you'd have been shuffling a bit nervously. And then suddenly, from inside the royal apartments, which were the other side of that archway, you'd have heard the chinking of the soldiers as the emperor moved into his position. And then suddenly, as the chamberlain gestured, the curtains would go back, bang, and there would be the emperor, stiff as a board, absolutely covered in white makeup, rigid on a golden throne. This beautiful silver plate shows it all. There's the emperor sitting under the arch, all wrapped up with a cloak of the finest purple silk, with clasps of gold, emeralds and pearls. All around him, a choir is singing of his heavenly power, and attendants hold flaming torches and waft incense all around the throne. All this ceremony, the Roman church would take for itself. This Diocletian wasn't only a god, he was an administrative genius. In 20 years' rule, he completely reorganized the Roman Empire. When he started, it was in a terrible state. The army wasn't getting paid, nobody was paying their taxes, the whole place was disrupted. But Diocletian was a very moral man, and he involved this new civil service with an amazing moral structure. He divided up his huge empire into brand new provinces, which he called dioceses. And to run them, he appointed administrators called vicars. And they wore robes just like those of modern priests. And they worked, Diocletian told them, for the good of the empire. Finally, Diocletian made more emperors, little Caesars, to help him administer this brand new empire. And the entire machine was built up around the image of imperial divinity. Naturally enough, any other universal religion inside the empire one that wasn't centred on Diocletian, would be persecuted. This isn't because of some imperial ego trip. It's actually because it seemed to be attacking the very centre of the structure which Diocletian had set up. One by one, lots of faiths were cut to pieces. And in 302, it was Christianity's turn. The persecution was so severe and so sustained that some of the Eastern churches still actually date their calendar from the year of persecution rather from the birth of Jesus Christ. And many of our most famous legends of saints like St. George and things like this are actually legends of martyrdoms that took place in that time. But from the imperial side, all the records are completely gone. There's just one little letter of a magistrate from North Africa. It's a very interesting letter. It tells how he and his colleagues turned up at a little church in the Libyan countryside. And there they asked the church vergers who were in charge whether they would hand over the treasure or you are dead men. So the vergers handed over their treasures. And then the magistrates wanted the center of the religion, the book, the Bible. Now these were kept on shelves outside the church, but the bookshelves were completely empty. 
Where were the books, the magistrates asked. Well, explained the Verges, we've um, lent them to people, but we actually can't remember their names at the moment. And the magistrates then threatened them with death. And then the report goes that one of the Verges got up and said, here we are, we are not traitors, kill us. Now, we don't know whether those men were killed or not, but just think of that. 1,600 years ago, in North Africa, a brave, lonely Christian, we don't even know his name, was protecting his Bible. But even gods got tired, it seemed. The work of running the huge empire exhausted Diocletian. That's why, in his old age, he built his palace at Split, by the side of a trout stream that he'd fished in when he'd been a boy. And after he moved in, he took up gardening. These great aqueducts spanning across the landscape, the great road network that still runs around here, that was all part of a sort of nervous system that fed the old man's palace and his nursery gardens for his food. So he lived in this great palace by the sea then. The old man seemed to see his empire fall apart. All those little Caesars he created suddenly started little wars all over the empire. One of his old generals wrote to him, suggesting that the great god Diocletian himself should take the field again. Do you know what the old man said? He wrote an extraordinary letter. He said to his colleague, if you could come to Split and see these splendid cabbages here that I've grown with my own hands, you'd never ask such a thing. It's a very strange thing for a god to say, isn't it? It's as if the old man had succumbed to that sort of loathing that was generally present in that age, a loathing for authority, a sort of desire to retreat from the world. If you were a Christian middle-class person, you might become a hermit and go to the desert. If you were Diocletian, you'd build a palace by the sea and live in it all alone. So that idea of the great imperial god that was sold like soap flakes all over the empire wasn't really on, was it? I mean, Diocletian is just a, a tired old civil servant doing his thing. So at the end, that wonderful structure he'd made, that wonderful imperial machine, really had no centre that people could believe in. It took one of his successors, Constantine, to actually find some glue to stick all that together, to sort of put the spirit in the machine. And he did it in an extraordinary way. He did a deal with Christianity. and pieces of Constantine the Great. What a man. In fact, that's exactly what he is. Not a god anymore. A vast imperial man. When the emperors had been gods, They'd been quite content to have their portraits made life-size, and in them, they appear as relaxed as other men. But as soon as Constantine gave up being a god, his imperial portraits became colossal, domineering and very tense. The bizarre relics of a strange man. Constantine's always been idolised by Christian historians distrusted by pagan ones. Even just recently, a professor said that, in his opinion, Constantine had been entrusted from a mission from God himself, whereas given that lovely old pagan in an elegant way suggests he's a bit of a wheeler dealer, dexterous, intrepid and affable, he calls it. I think he's probably a bit of a mixture of the two, a bit of a wheeler dealer and a lot of a Christian. One thing I do know about him is career. He was crowned, believe it or not, in Yorkshire after his father died. They were in battle together, and he was crowned as one of the emperors of the Western Empire. Seven years later, he conquered the whole Western Empire, entered Rome in triumph. Twelve years after that, he would conquered the whole Eastern Empire as well. And then he called a conference, almost immediately. He didn't call a conference of his generals, however. He called a conference of Christian bishops. The 
Bishops came from all over the Roman Empire, rich and poor alike, traveling by river, land and sea, to gather at a city that today is close to modern Istanbul. The persecutions had finally stopped and the great old engine of the Roman Empire was filled with a new fuel, the Christian faith. In this little town, in the year 325, state Christianity, imperial Christianity, was born. This is the legendary location where the bishops came to answer Constantine's summons. This is the place where the first universal council of the Christian church took place. Nicaea in Turkey. And that word Nicaea has given us the Nicene Creed, that basic statement of Christian belief, which is really shared by all Christian churches today. That is why you could say that in this very field, the Christian church has its real beginnings. Every church that is present in the world, you could say, had a member of this council. We're all descended from it, if you like. I Can you imagine this incredibly diverse gathering of splendid people, all gathered in this hall? You can see them sitting in serried ranks, chattering and talking, dozens of different languages. Constantine hadn't convened his council to come here and talk about church business of the day. He'd come to talk about the nature of power and where the demarcation was. Power in heaven and, of course, its alternative power on earth. The creed, that creed which we still use today, fluffed up a bit and everything, but that essential creed was proposed to the council by Constantine's own secretary. He'd been the Bishop of Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, since the earliest days of Christianity, this basic creed had been recited at baptisms. And it was that, which is the few alterations, that Constantine managed to encourage the majority of bishops here to accept. Doubtless, they actually believed it as a serious theological statement. They felt deeply about the nature of God. But I can't help feeling that Constantine was after something more than just abstract theology. Look, I'll show you what I mean. It's to do exactly with the shape of God. If you have God as a father, a great power that sits in the sky, and then you have this divinity that sort of trickles down so that you have Jesus, his son, and you have saints and holy men and popes and bishops and, and emperors, and everybody has this little bit of divine power. It makes a very muddy picture for Constantine. He wants to be the main act on earth, and that means, of course, cutting out all these little trickle-downs of power and stuffing God clearly up into heaven. It, this issue comes over very clearly with Jesus Christ. There were many bishops here who would have died for the belief that Jesus had been a man and a God in one person on earth. Now, that means, of course, that there could be other men who had become gods as well. And these could then set up as opposition, or as confusers, you might say, to Constantine's supreme position of power. So, the Holy Trinity, which is, which, as I said, a deeply believed doctrine, actually served Constantine to push all this up into heaven. God, you could say, was composed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's very mysterious, but sure enough, it's way up in the sky, far away from power. Constantine's down here on his throne. I So these theological issues, which at first might seem pretty obscure, can actually have a direct effect on the power of governments and kings. And that's why, throughout the ages, people have been killed in the name of Jesus Christ. So what did all this imperial politicking do for the books of the Bible? In short, 
it made them the guidebooks of the Western world. Nowadays, Bibles made in the time of Constantine are perhaps the world's most precious books. And one of them, the Codex Sinaiticus, taken from a desert monastery in Egypt and held now in the library of the British Museum, is the most famous single book in all the world. You know, it's very possible that this Bible here is actually one of the Bibles, one of 50 Bibles ordered by Constantine for his new church. He asked for 50 Bibles, easy to read and portable. And these look like royal Bibles, don't they? This beautiful, calm, clear Greek. Practically the oldest complete Bible in the world today. It was written by three scribes at dictation, each of them took a third of the book. And in it is a rather rare little memoir, right at the book of Esther, jammed in between the elegant prose. There's a little text written by somebody who checked the Bible, because these Bibles were checked and checked. There's 14 and a half thousand checks in this Bible alone. So careful were they about the text. Anyway, this man writing at the end of the book of Esther says that he checked this Bible against another Bible, against the yet older Bible. And we know this man's name because he's written it. It's called Pamphilius. And Pamphilius was a martyr in the time of Diocletian. And he shared a prison cell with Constantine's secretary, the same man who 20 years later made the first draft of the Council of Nicaea and probably saw to the making of these Bibles as well. So think of that. Think how the Bible has triumphed, how it's come through. And that care is astonishing. There is no other ancient book in the world which is so perfectly preserved. The text in this Bible is exactly the same as the text in earlier Bible fragments two centuries before. And there it is, this strange book, burnt and persecuted by Diocletian, is now right at the heart of the empire. Asia Minor, at the very centre of Constantine the Great's new empire, was the natural site for a new imperial capital. A new Rome, set halfway between East and West, between the Danube and the Euphrates, where Europe meets Asia, and where modern Istanbul now stands. It would be the first Christian capital of the Roman Empire. With his usual modesty, Constantine called it Constantinople. Like Constantine himself, the city was filled with superstitions, ancient signs and symbols, memories of much older gods. This beautiful stone actually stands in the centre of what used to be Constantine's Imperial Racing Stadium. It's for chariot races. You see, they started off over there, galloped down the street, round the end of the stadium, and then roared down the street down here for the finish. It was always at the centre of the city life of Constantinople. It was a great favourite. The Imperial Palace was just over there, and there was a special little covered way by which the Emperor could come into his box to watch the chariot races. Everybody thought it was a fabulous city with the water all around it and everything, but it was also a pretty gym crack affair. Constantine had had it built too quickly and the buildings were badly made and some of them were pretty ill designed too. But what he did to compensate was quite a clever thing. He actually plundered the Western Empire of its treasures, all the great statues and lots of beautiful things and famous historical things from the West were brought here to Constantine's new Rome. Just look, just look at the things that are gathered up even in his stadium. This obelisk is ancient Egyptian, made thousands of years before Constantine's time, came from Thebes. Over there is a very famous object, a funny old column made of three snakes, which celebrated a victory of the Greeks over the Persians, 500 BC. The great horses of St. Mark's in Venice, they were taken from this square. I suppose Constantine had this thing about relics. He loved old things. He loved things that were filled with history and religion, holy objects, relics. 
But the greatest of all of Constantine's relics wasn't any object, but an entire country. Jesus had lived in Palestine. Constantine now turned his attentions to this poor province of his empire. In a few years, the literary landscapes of the Bible were marked out upon the earth. Constantine made Palestine into a holy land, the birthplace of his new imperial religion. The Nicene Creed had said that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Constantine now built a church of the Nativity at Bethlehem, an ancient sacred spot selected by Constantine's bishops, controlled by his imperial church and sacred still today. On every spot where Jesus' life on earth had touched with heaven, his place of birth, of death, of resurrection and ascension into heaven, Constantine built a church. And these today are Christendom's most sacred shrines. Constantine built the biggest of his churches at Jerusalem, at the place of Jesus' crucifixion and entombment. Most of it's gone now. Its ruins are filled with monasteries and an Arab bazaar. This isn't just an ordinary baker's storeroom. Look at the walls. Look at those huge stones. Only Herod the Great or the Emperor Constantine ever made walls in Jerusalem with such big blocks of stone. In fact, that's the end wall of Constantine's church. Even in his day, there were little shops along here. You could walk down through the street, through the market, look into the church, into its great glittering nave. Isn't that extraordinary? The doorway of Constantine's church has ended up as the basement in a Coptic monastery. Bits of it are still here, though. Look, there's part of the great door frame. Would have sailed on up into the air much higher than that, had great cedar doors that creaked open. Bit of the bolt still there, even. 
there's an extraordinary letter which was written from this very spot where I'm standing, right from the middle of the doorway, looking out from the little marketplace, looking in towards the great church beyond. It's written by Constantine's secretary, and he thought it was the marvel of the age. He describes rows and rows of columns going back hundreds of yards. And above it all was the coffered roof that Constantine had wanted. And the coffered roof, his secretary said, had so much gold on it that it seemed to flash and fill the church with its light, coming right down through the lights, running across the pavement. <laughs> Today, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands on the site of Constantine's great church. It's changed a lot, but underneath you can still see the arrangements that Constantine made for the holy sites. Up there is Calvary. You can't see the rock anymore. It's all covered up in balustrades and beautiful mosaics. Constantine's day, it had a great golden cross on it, bejeweled, symbol of the new faith, the resurrected Lord. I'm standing approximately on the site of the road which once ran round the walls of Jerusalem. And over there is the site of Christ's tomb. Seventeen hundred years on, and the pilgrims still visit the place which Constantine's bishops had decided was the tomb of Christ. You may well wonder whether that strange old monument really is on the site of the real tomb of Jesus Christ. Well, there's some remarkable indications that it is quite close by. This sooty little chapel is still sooty from a fire a hundred years ago, and nobody's decided what colour to paint it again yet. But this sooty little chapel is immediately behind the tomb. The tomb stands in the main building over there. This wall here is the original back wall of Constantine's great church. And through here is something hundreds of years older. These are ancient tombs. And ancient tombs with this little round top looked a bit like ancient ovens. And in Hebrew, they're called hohim, oven. And these tombs, constructed according to the traditional ritual measurements of Jewish tombs. That is six handbreadths wide. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, traditionally, this is part of the family tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. It's the man who gave his own tomb up to Jesus. What they are for certain is a Jewish part of a Jewish cemetery from around the time of Jesus. So that proves conclusively that Constantine's site in which he built Christ's tomb was really in the middle of an ancient Jewish graveyard. Not only that, the fact there's an ancient Jewish graveyard here shows that something that's now in the middle of Jerusalem was in those days outside the walls. And that shows that Calvary is in a prob probable site for the real event itself too. But Constantine's bishops had a bit of a problem because, all right, they've got this traditional site and they've got a Jewish graveyard in it. But how do they know that the tomb they picked was real and not these little ones over here? How do they know which tomb to pick? Well, the records say that the workmen were clearing the rubble away and the priests were watching them and suddenly they saw the tomb of the risen Lord and it was risen like the Lord himself. They found the tomb in the dirt. It was an identification by tradition and by faith. Now you might get done under the Trade Descriptions Act, but in those days, faith and tradition 
were the Trade and Descriptions Act, they were as important and real to them as that level of truth in trade is to us today. Anyway, it was real enough for Constantine to build his huge church right over the top of the site. Christ's tomb became the center of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem for a thousand years, the center of the Christian world, the place where the point of God's compasses had touched the earth and scribed out the circles of the universe. And Constantine, it's said that he was baptized finally on his deathbed. His ministers had been so scared of him that no one would touch his corpse for months. The man had still ruled as he had rotted on his throne. Now notice that Constantine built the heart of his empire in the Greek world of the Eastern Mediterranean, far away from Rome and Latin Italy. So the Church of Rome was no longer the church, the emperor's church, at the centre of the empire. This made life very difficult for the bishop, the Pope of Rome, for this was still not a truly Christian city. Constantine could turn Palestine into a holy land. He could build great Christian capitals for his empire in the east. But he couldn't make old Rome Christian. Even though he left his name over monuments all over its forum, the old city was a pagan city. And it had such prestige. It was essential for the Christian church to dominate the place. And yet even emperors were afraid to come here. Not Constantine, but the great Diocletian. After he'd built the senators, that really shrewd, hard body of pagans, their new senate house, he wouldn't even turn up for the opening of it. And still, 50 years after Constantine's death, these same tough old individuals would turn up for their debates and offer to an altar of victory with a little goddess in the back, right in the back of their senate house. And of course, it annoyed the Christian bishops. They wrote to Rome and protested, how dare you sacrifice to these pagan gods? No emperor is so friendly with the barbarians as not to require an altar of victory, they said. And they started to produce a whole lot of very good and clear arguments about why Rome should stay a pagan city forevermore. Intellectually, they were very smart people. And why shouldn't the city stay pagan after all? It was saturated with gods and history and had been for 500 years. What did Constantine's church have to offer after all? Well, a lot of new churches, a lot of money, but none of the richness of tradition and deity that Rome had. Of course, Christianity had its own world, had its own riches, and those images were in the Bible. But that, the Romans told the Pope, was written in such barbarous Greek that nobody would ever want to read it unless they were Christian. And there were few enough of those about the place. So in 382, the Pope got his secretary, a man called Jerome, to translate the Bible into good Latin, and that, he hoped, would conquer this sinful city. Jerome was born in 342, in Aquileia, on the Italian Adriatic, just up the coast from Diocletian's palace. Jerome must have walked on these floors, must have known all these pictures. He'd have known them when he was a little boy, coming in with his father from the family estates into the big town of Aquileia. He'd have known them later on in his life, too, when he came back to his hometown to live after he'd been a student in Rome. I don't suppose he thought much of them, though. All these big, fat fishes. All the Aquileia mosaics seem obsessed with food. Jerome actually says the Aquileians were obsessed with it, too. Even more, he says, their love of food and the love of God. There's one thing here I think you would have really liked, because in the middle of this great pagan seascape, you've actually got the story of Jonah and the whale. There's the prophet being fed into the mouth of the whale, and here's the people in the boat all around him. The little boat, of course, is just like the ones that skim around in Aquileia Harbour. The people dressed like Jerome's contemporaries. 
Now, he would have liked this story, as a lot of Christians did at the time, because it seemed to them to be a prophecy of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jonah was fed into the whale to save the little boat, and he spent three days in hell, he calls it, in the belly of the whale, just as Jesus spent three days in the tomb before his resurrection. And over here is Jonah's resurrection, popping up onto dry land out of the belly of the whale. And just as Jesus had his day in paradise, so Jonah had his too. The Lord built him a wonderful bower of gourds outside Nineveh. And there's the Old Testament prophet splendidly relaxing. Aquileia turned out to be far from a paradise for poor old Jerome. All his life, he was sort of dogged by scandal. It, it sent him out of all the places he loved, really. It sent him out of Aquileia, it sent him out of Rome. He never quite tells you what it is. There's sort of sexual innuendos going on. He says at one point that the, the virgin nuns closed their doors against him. And certainly people still feel very powerfully about Jerome. He, for himself, defends himself vigorously, defends his freedom to act in the way he wants. He said, yes, I've been guilty, but I've done nothing wrong. And it's that sort of cloud of unknowing, cloud of mystery, that still hangs around the man. One thing's certain, those scandals sent him into exile, and they sent him into exile in the East for year after year after year. In fact, for a man of Latin background and Latin character, he lived most of his life away from his native language. Jerome spent much of his time traveling. He went to the Holy Land and lived in Bethlehem. He went to Egypt and studied with the most eminent of theologians. He went to Constantinople to attend a general council of the church. He almost died of fever once in Syria. And as he traveled, he was learning languages, Greek, perfect Greek, and Hebrew from a Palestinian Jew. Aramaic, the very language of Jesus from the Syrian monks. For many years, he lived as a hermit in a desert cave. This is how so many artists like to see Jerome, assailed by demons and fortified by God in the deserts of the soul. He's such a favorite subject, I think, because his writings are so human. The candor of his letters is amazing. He's a Henry Miller of a monk, as much in love with a child's smile and the curve of a woman's knee as with fine Latin prose. What a great scholar, what a worker he was. The only man of his day who could read the Bible's books in all their original languages. Jerome spent 25 years translating the Bible. It was a colossal enterprise. And one, I think, to which his whole attitude can be summed up in just a little story. Remember that lovely scene of Jonah sitting under his bower of gourds? Well, when Jerome was working on the book of Jonah, right from the original Hebrew into Latin, he realized the word wasn't gourd at all, but ivy, and he translated it as ivy. Now, that scene was a favorite amongst early Christians. It was all over pictures in the churches and all over everywhere. Nonetheless, ivy went in the Bible. Now, when the translation was read out in a North African church, his friend St. Augustine wrote him a letter saying there had actually been a riot. People had screamed and run out of the church. St. Augustine also suggested that perhaps Jerome should lay off the novelty because the book as it was was perfectly good for guiding the faithful. But Jerome would have none of it. He once said, some of his critics had porridge for brains, he was after the truth. He said he was after separating the mud from the water. He said you should look at the Bible text like a hunter looks for game in the forest, for the truth alone. And what a man. That amazing honesty, almost naivety, his actual desire for a fight, all that gives that prose an amazing bounce. His Bible was a superb Bible. Some people, in fact, think it's the very word of God itself. <laughs>
In 395, the great empire of Constantine, which had long been under attack from northern Gothic tribes, was divided in two, east and west. In 410, the Goths arrived at Rome itself. What will be left to us, the senators asked of the Goths, when they demanded an impossible ransom? Your lives, came the reply. Old Rome was looted and burnt. Jerome, an old man now in Bethlehem, was inconsolable. It seemed to him that Rome, the distant city for whom he'd worked all his life, had simply disappeared. When Rome had been plundered and half destroyed by the northern tribes, he said the world, the universe, had been quenched in a single city. So you can imagine he'd be quite pleased to see Rome today. Actually, in those days, this part of Rome, Jerome's time, was vineyards, lovely big vineyards stretching up the hill, with just a few rather exclusive villas dotted in between them. He knew the area quite well. He certainly knew that church. His day, of course, it was a very plain, simple brick building, enormous, but quite plain. Now, 1,700 years later, decorated by generations of faith, it's one of Christendom's most beautiful churches, Santa Maria Maggiore. They say that the high altar of Santa Maria Maggiore contains the bones of 40 saints, including Saint Jerome. His Bible, called the Vulgate Bible, is now the Latin Bible of the Roman Church. In illo tempore, isit Jesu turbis iude horum, ego sum panis vivo qui de celo descendi. Siquis manduca verites o pane vivet in eternum, e panis que me godavo caro mea es pro mundi vita. Constantine the Great would feel at home in here. The priests are still dressed like his courtiers. The church is like the throne room of his palace. He would, perhaps, be amazed by the Christian piety of the modern Romans. And the prestige of their church, too. Most of all, he'd be astonished by the sweet majesty of the Latin Bible. The book that he had used to join his empire to the hearts of men. To join the kingdom of heaven to the kingdoms of earth. <laughs> 